Mr. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Kriva. I'm the CEO and president of the Aquarium of Pacific. And this is another in our, in our series of First Wednesdays. This is one of those days where so it's so busy, I don't even know where I am. But um, tonight is especially a great talk because I, I, you can't help but be fascinated by octopuses. They are, if I were to say anything, they are my spirit animal, but I'm not going to explain that because it's a twisted tail. But I, <laughs> but, uh, I always love to go and watch them. And we have two great speakers tonight. We have Cy Montgomery, who's the author of the, of the book you'll be signing. I mean, she'll be signing, and I hope you'll be purchasing. But she's a naturalist and author of over 38 books. And reading from her bio, this is what I like. Um, she's been chased by an angry gorilla in his air, swum with pink dolphins, electric eels, and uh, been undressed in the wild by an orangutan. But she's never faced an audience like this. So that's all I got to say is, is warn her about that. And then um, Warren Carlisle is the founder and CEO of OctoNation. What a great name for a nonprofit. Over a million members. And basically, the idea is to inspire people to care about the ocean by learning about octopuses. And I think that's fabulous. You know, that's much the theme of the aquarium. Learn about our animals and we'll inspire you to care about the ocean. And with that, I want to invite Cy and Warren up here to um, give their talk. Hello, hello. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Boy, have we had a great day to, here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And it is a thrill for us to share our new book with so many Octo fans. <laughs> A lot of folks don't realize that this new book is the companion to a National Geographic film series that will be on television. So we'd like to start by showing you the trailer for that series, which is going to air on Earth Day. Yeah, we were just talking. We were like, this is, for the octopus people, this is like our Eras tour, this is our World Series, this is our, like, we were trying, we were coming up with so many different things, and I think after you watch the trailer, I mean, you'll be just as pumped as we are. So, and we can turn this off real quick. How do you find a creature that can blend in against any background. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. They're as curious about you as you are about them. It just felt like magic. Every encounter with an octopus feels like a really intimate moment. What more do they have to tell us? Well, octopuses have a great deal more to tell us. And what we'd like to do is tell you about our own octopus journey, which for me began in New England Aquarium in March of 2011. And on that day, I met someone who changed my life. Her name was Athena. And if she stood up, she'd only stand about four feet tall. She weighed only about 40 pounds, but she had a very powerful impact on my life. She was like no one I'd ever met before because she had a beak like a parrot and could shoot ink like an old-fashioned pen. She could change color and shape and pour her baggy, boneless body through an opening the size of a walnut. And that is because Athena was a giant Pacific octopus. 
And when I first met her at the aquarium, one of her keepers opened the top of, you know, you have to have a lid on your octopus tank or else the octopus will get out and that is no good. I didn't know what to expect. But as soon as the top was opened, her eyes found mine. I saw them swivel in their socket and lock onto my face. And this beautiful creature slid from her lair, turned bright red with excitement, and flowed like a silk scarf into the water from her rocky lair. And the next thing I knew, I saw her arms boiling up out of the water, her suckers reaching toward me. And I asked Scott, the keeper, can I touch her? And he said, sure. So I plunged my hands and arms into the freezing 47 degree cold water, and soon my skin was covered with the soft white questing suckers of an octopus. And I realized that when I got home, I was going to have to explain to my husband the hickeys. <laughs> now, this was a wild experience when I would explain to other people what this was like, many of them would go, ew, aren't they slimy? Wasn't it cold? Was it gross? And it's true, had a person become so handsy with me upon first meeting them, it would have been alarming. And I was aware that with those suckers, she was not just touching me, but tasting me. And a person tasting you so early in a relationship is also off-putting. <laughs> but since this was a giant Pacific octopus, I was elated. She actually let me pet her head, too, which no one had done before. And when I touched her, her skin turned white, which is the color of a relaxed octopus. The reason for my elation was that even though we were separated by half a billion years of evolution, because the last time humans and octopuses shared a common ancestor, everyone was a two, despite this great vertebral divide between us and them, I felt like there was a connection. And this was important, because I was interested in octopuses' minds. And this is something that philosophers were not comfortable discussing for a very long time. And it's particularly alarming when you realize that she was a mollusk. Octopuses are mollusks related to clams and snails. And clams do not even have brains. But 13 years ago, I already felt that it would be possible to meet the mind of a mollusk. And I came back every week for years to visit with these octopuses and get to know them. And that was the start of an adventure that resulted in a cascade of blessings that continue to this day. My meeting with Athena led to three years of getting to know these octopuses. It led to the book, The Soul of an Octopus, which became an international bestseller to everyone's shock, and was even a finalist for this huge literary prize. They never give prizes like that to natural history books. But the spirits of these animals connected with people. And that book led to the founding of the International Octopus Fan Club, known as Octonation, and to my friendship with Warren, and to this brand new book and TV series with National Geographic. So tonight, my partner in all things octopus, Octonation founder, Warren Carlyle, and I want to share with you the story of our octopus odyssey together. So let us start by introducing you to Warren and his story. So this is me. <laughs> um, I was uh, diagnosed with autism when I was around four years old, and the thing that I was most excited to do was to make flashcards. I made flashcards for everything, 
And I remember going to the library, I mean, going to the aquarium one day, and we were walking in a single file line. And I remember thinking, I can't see any of the animals. So I was like, I'm going to drop to the back of the line. And then when no one's paying attention to me, I'm just going to drop off the line and take my own aquarium tour. Um, <laughs> and so that's what I ended up doing. And I remember standing in front of um, the exhibit and watching this octopus kind of like follow me around. And I kept eye contact with it. And as I would move, it would kind of move along with me. I don't know if the video is playing. Yeah. And I just remember there was a moment there where I was just like, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> like, um, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I wonder if there are more, or like, are there, do they come in different colors? I didn't, I didn't know anything. And so I immediately go to the library um, and start to try to find anything on these creatures. And when I was a kid, uh, there was really no books. Um, I went and I saw there was an encyclopedia, and it talked about the giant Pacific octopus, the common octopus, things that we've seen, you know, a hundred times, you know. And I was just like, it said, but there are many more species. And if you know anything about somebody who's neurodivergent or has autism, when we have an open loop for something, it ends up the largest octopus fan club on the planet. But it ends up, it ends up with just like this curiosity where I was just like, I have no background in this whatsoever. Um, and, you know, my, you know, with people who are ADHD, we have all these special interests. Um, I went on to be a classical saxophone performance major, you know, and then I was like, I'm kind of tired of this. I kind of did it. And then I ended up being a, a studio manager for a celebrity fashion photographer. I was just like, this is fun, but this isn't it. Um, and so I learned influencer marketing in and out. And then, uh, like many of you, just a show of hands, how many people have read Soul of an Octopus already? So many of you. So just like you, I picked up this book. Um, with this incredible woman, and I, I pick it up, and in the first three pages, she answered a question that I'd been asking my whole entire life, which was, why doesn't this creature have more? You know, um, why aren't there books? Why aren't there um, more art? Why isn't there more? And um, I emailed her, and I said, hey, I think I have this idea. I'm working in New York. You know, I don't really like what I do, but I want to start this octopus fan club, but I have no background, and I was kind of waiting for her to tell me, no, this is a horrible idea. But she emailed me back, and she just said, you're the guy to do this. You know, go forth and co conquer Octo King. <laughs> and I was just like, well, that's all the validation I really needed for this. Um, and so I started at 2 o'clock in the morning. I had a, a phone call with my brother who said, octopus, he was just like, I've never even heard of them before. He was like, shouldn't you cho choose an animal that's like more people care about, like something that's like going extinct? And I was just like, you know, this kind of re represents what, what the issue is with, you know, people focusing on animals that are gone. I said, the octopus has been around for hundreds of millions of years. And we, should, we have a lot to learn from them. And he was just like, I still think you should choose, like, I don't know, like a turtle or something. And so I started it at 2 AM and um, reached out to Sai and uh, ended up meeting her. And I, I got to meet her with her namesake, Sai. I remember before meeting her, I was like shaking because she's like my Beyonce. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> some people met her in Mystic and they were the same way. She just had such a profound impact on my life that I was like, I don't even know what to say to her. Um, so I just attempted to make words, and I think I did. Um, and so after that, um, I start interacting with people all over the world, um, artists, underwater photographers. Um, I start sharing their stories. A lot of their footage, they said, we've been trying to get featured by a lot of different organizations, or, um, but it's hard to get a hold of them. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll run it tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, and so we started growing, and I started creating more assets for people to kind of share their affinity. And so we had people that were all over sharing um, their love, and they were admitting to the world that they were octopus fans. And those grew the next wave of octopus fans. And then I got to meet with a lot of um, Aquarius from all over the world. 
And I remember early on in Octonation, people were just like, well, what's your stance on aquariums? I was like, well, aquariums are on the front lines of ocean conservation on a daily basis. Um, we love them. And you know, we had to make a rule you know, in our community that we were, we were very much, um, we very much loved aquariums. And so over the course of time, you could tell, uh, for those of you who have been following Octonation for a long time, I tried in the beginning. I'm not a branding you know, uh, person. I'm not an illustrator. So I just used the octopus emoji in the world. I figured everybody could use that. And then I graduated, and my friend um, made me this cool Octonation banner. And then um, Alfredo Ortiz, another community member, uh, created uh, the other icon. And then I got to meet Chris um, Adams, who uh, created this, created Octonation, and really brought us into this new age um, of, of designs and things like that. Um, so I've been working with him since then. And then some of you know Chelsea, who is the Octo girl. And I got to work with her, and she would read my writing, and she's like, I love reading your writing. She goes, can I edit it? <laughs> um, She's just like, I, I, love the, I love where you're going with this, um, which just needs a little, a little editing. And so it was great because now we had this big platform that we had somebody um, that wanted to co-sign every single post to make sure that, it was, um, that we were sharing the right information, which was great. Um, so since then, me and her have been on the news together. We've done so much, so many cool things together. And with Chris, as you know, we have Octo merch. And another thing about autism is when we see something, we want it to be anatomically, well, want it to be anatomically correct. And so we're like, the, the eyes are wrong. I don't know if, if anybody of you are like that. Or we're like, that thing has two siphons. They only have one. And so we created this series of anatomically correct um, uh, illustrations that were fun, informative. People could wear it. Um, they could showcase their love. They could talk about liking coffee and octopus. Like we just really, you know, we really wanted to create all these like intermixes of fandoms. Um, and then we grew. Um, our team grew um, to more people, um, and we started going around and, and doing Octopus Superhero Academy. Uh, and then members' babies were born, and we would create, you know, Octonation's newest member, um, uh, one of our friends, Ryan, uh, who's also a brilliant underwater photographer. Um, and we went around and we started uh, learning. And I, I feel like I wanted to create the thing that I would have wanted to see when I was seven years old and was met with really no nothing octopus. I thought it'd be so cool if this troop came into our school and you know, taught Octopus Superhero Academy. And then today, um, it's a really a full circle moment, and we were, um, uh, at, we were just at a, another aquarium, and it was the first time that we got to say this, but it was like, this is a really full circle moment for me and Sai, after having read her book. Now we're going around on a book tour, um, and it's really like a love letter from us and the octopuses to all of you. Um, we typically, me and Sai, are like in our own dens, in our offices. Uh, we don't really go out and speak all that much, and so it's, it's really fun to be doing this with my mentor. Well, when National Geographic asked me to do the book that would go with the TV series, of course I instantly insisted that we get the nation on board and have Warren write the, the octo profiles in the end because people think there's just one kind of octopus, but they are so, so varied. And they're all individuals. Getting to know them changes your life, changed my life certainly forever. For one thing, it opened the sea to me. At age 56, I am now 66, but at age 56, I finally became scuba certified so that I could meet them in the wild as well. And I write about that in the book. More than anything, though, they changed my way of thinking about thinking. Because here's someone whose mind works quite similar to the way ours work, and yet, you would have to go to outer space or science fiction to find a creature more unlike a human than an octopus. For example, we go head, body, limbs. Not them. 
that thing <laughs> that looks like it's its head, that everyone thinks is its head, that's not their head. This is their mantle. You all probably know this, but lots of toy manufacturers and artists draw a little smiley face on their, essentially their thorax, which is instead housing their organs of digestion and reproduction and respiration. The part that's the head is attached conveniently to their limbs. And where's their mouth? Of course, it is in their armpits. It's just wild. And inside the mouth is a beak like a parrot, which creates the wound through which it can select, um, inject its venom. All octopuses are venomous. Some are more venomous than others. Yeah, you have this beautiful blue ring um, that, as you know, produces a venom called tetrodotoxin that's a thousand times more lethal than cyanide. All octopuses, by the way, have blue blood, and here you can see the blue blood coursing through an arm, pumped through the three hearts. They have their suckers. Um, suckers are really cool. Not only can they taste and smell, but they can also, they're really, really strong. Each sucker, a giant Pacific, this one right here, has 2,240 of them, and some of the bigger ones can move up to 35 pounds. There are octopuses with antifreeze in their blood that allows them to live in the Arctic waters. Okay. There's the hot water volcano octopus. This is called the Volcan octopus. And it lives next to 200 degree, 150 degree hydrothermal vents. Um, and it navigates its area by feeling around, chemotactile sensation. Um, it's really cool. There's octopuses who walk around on two limbs, looking rather like a harried commuter. <laughs> and there are octopuses that can breathe um, on land through uh, a thing called passive diffusion, similar like frogs. Um, but they're perfectly comfortable, you know, just walking from tide pool to tide pool and um, finding delicious fish in, in between. So there's over 300 species of octopus. New species are being discovered practically every month. Each has its own unique superpower, and Warren's going to introduce a few of these right now. Yeah, this is where I get to geek out. Um, so yes, this is the blanket octopus. Um, some of you have seen it on Octonation, but I, I call this like the Beyonce of, she's the Beyonce of octopus people. This is the Beyonce of octopus. <laughs> Um, I mean, she, this is a female blanket octopus. The male grows the size of basically her eyeball. Um, what's really interesting about this species is that she spends her whole entire life floating through the open ocean. She never touches the ocean floor. And she, to appear larger to predators in the open ocean, she'll unfurl this cape and find you know, Portuguese man of war and rip off the tentacles and use them almost like nunchucks, just kind of navigating her way through the open ocean. And another thing that she can do, um, if you see right here, and you don't need the music uh, if you don't want to, um, she's just swimming through the open ocean, as she does looking gorgeous. And she can actually bring her cape up. If she wants to swim a little bit faster, she can always have that as an option. And it, allows her to swim faster through the water. Now, when it comes time to lay her eggs, like Jack and the Beanstalk, she grows these um, calcium carbonate stalks out of her body. And she spends time braiding eggs, hundreds of thousands of eggs. And as you can tell, there's like different colors because they actually have like different gestation periods of, of like the eggs. Um, and so you can see some have hatched over there, some are alive and waiting to be hatched here, and then those are brand new up top. But the fascinating thing is that she just grows these natural, you know, nature finds a way, just grows these natural um, stalks out of her body to attach these eggs to. The hairy octopus, this is one of my favorite species that I actually got to put in the book. I like fought for this species to be put in the book. Our community knows this as like the Chewboctopus. Um, <laughs> It looks like an octopus that you know, has like a bad hair day. Um, but they're the size of your fingernail. And what's really interesting about this species is that 
They have yet to be scientifically described, and I wanted to include them in the book because it just goes to show you like how much we still have to learn about these creatures. We don't know how long the hairy octopus lives. We've never seen, seen them eating. Um, but what we do know, um, and this is also really fun to watch, is that they... So what you witnessed there was, it's very similar to kind of like me, instead of like walking away, it just kind of like, it uses the ocean currents as like almost like ride share. Um, and so it just throws its body up and it's just like, okay, I don't want to look like an octopus. So it just kind of lets the currents take it different places. And uh, I just think it's a really cool behavior. Um, and again, uh, a behavior that you don't see every octopus do, just certain ones, um, so just amazing. Another one of my favorite species um, is the Caribbean reef octopus. Um, just a gorgeous animal, and our, again, our community is the best on the planet. We have hundreds of comments all the time, and I, I read every single one of them. And uh, somebody said, this looks just like Cinderella's dress. And you know, when you look at the photos of them, I mean, you can just see this is the most gorgeous you know, webbing. It's almost like a circus tent. And the way that they hunt is very uh, interesting, too. I have a, a quick video of it. But what they'll do is they'll emerge from their den, and they'll kind of navigate around, and then throw their arms uh, around coral heads, like completely throw them around. And you can see it catches something, because it moves a little bit. So it got something. So it's like, OK, I'm done here. I can move off. And this is just a really interesting behavior. They have so many fascinating behaviors. And what I've found um, is every single night, I would learn about a new behavior. I'd go on like Google Scholar, I'd go somewhere, and then of course pass it through Chelsea, and be like, can I say this about this, about this octopus? She goes, yeah, that's, that's fun. And the other thing, she'd be like, you're pushing it. Um, <laughs> but I would want to educate in a way that made people feel like almost as if, again, it's a love letter from the octopus to, to the person. And so um, just really, again, grateful that we got to share some of these species. Um, you'll see more in the end of the book. So as, as specios, as different as each species is from another, that is the case with individual octopuses as well. They have very distinct personalities, and this is often reflected in the names that Aquarius give them. There was one at Seattle Aquarium who was so shy she never came out from behind the filter. So they named her Emily Dickinson and let her go in the sound because it was no good for the public. But there was another one who was so overly friendly, they named him Leisure Suit Larry. Well, Athena, I learned, had earned her name. She was named after the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. She was a feisty octopus. Octavia proved to be even more feisty. The first time I met her, she wanted nothing to do with me. We were trying to hand her a squid on the end of a grabber to make friends. She didn't want the squid, she didn't want the grabber, she didn't want us. We offered this again and again. She had no interest. But then, later in the afternoon, we handed her the squid on the grabber, and she grabbed the squid, grabbed the grabber, and then grabbed me, and began pulling me into the tank. Now, I wouldn't fit, of course, because of my annoying skeleton, and also there was a problem of my lungs wanting air and not water. But I felt honored. and. She did literally pull me into the world of the octopus. I felt I was not under attack, but under investigation, and that her curiosity had been piqued. That octopuses are so curious is clear from the fact that they famously enjoy many of the same intellectual challenges that we do. They like to play with the same toys that our children enjoy. They like to play with Mr. Potato Head, for example. And they like to play with Legos. They enjoy solving puzzles. 
sometimes they like to steal stuff from you. We had this experience with Octavia that I went in um, with a crew from the radio show Living on Earth, and we were all feeding her fish, and we were stroking her, we were watching her change color. It was the most amazing experience. We were lost in the sensation of this gorgeous animal. And then we thought, let's give her another fish. We looked up, where's the bucket? Well, she'd stolen it. And she had it under her webbing the whole time, and she was just doing, I know she was just laughing at us. It was hilarious. They are smart enough to remember human faces. We know this from experience um, because there have been experiments done at Seattle Aquarium in which aquarium volunteers who were dressed identically were asked to half the volunteers always gave the octopus delicious fish, the other half touched the octopus with an annoying bristly stick. And very soon, the octopus is simply from looking up through the water at the human faces. Even if you left your delicious fish or your annoying stick at home, they knew who their friends were. And they would go towards the people who had given them fish in the past. And as far as those who had touched them with the bristly stick, they would jet away. But every once in a while, before they jetted away, they'd shoot them in the face with a fountain of freezing cold salt water. So how smart are octopus? This is one of the things we explore in the new book, Secrets of the Octopus. They are far smarter than anyone ever dreamed. Uh, they are smart enough, for example, to outwit the scientists who are studying them. Yeah, everything, any octopus thing that goes viral, everyone sends me DMs already. And I remember this was a story that I loved where a scientist was looking at an octopus and he put a camera in to, to kind of film, film the octopus and uh, the octopus actually turned the camera around and took a picture of him. Uh, and so, just hilarious. They are smart enough to not just blend in with their background, but they can imitate other creatures. And they can do it so convincingly that scientists have filmed them, essentially the mimic octopus can turn into a whole bunch of different animals. When it turns into a flounder, it does such a a convincing imitation of the flounder that flounders will follow it around. They are smart enough to cooperatively hunt with other species, just like a person would hunt with hawks or a hound. And Octavia very quickly learned to recognize me, and I know we enjoyed each other's company. I know this because, of course, if she didn't want to see me, she would jet away, or she would make an eye bar, or she would squirt me in the face with water. But I also know this from other experiences, and one was when I had been gone on another assignment for several weeks and hadn't seen her. I didn't know for sure that she would even recognize me. But not only did she recognize me, she came out of her lair. She turned bright red with excitement. She held on to me for an hour and 15 minutes, looking up into my face and hugging me and kissing me with her suckers. And it was just like with a person when you haven't seen them in too long. And it's you, it's you, it's you. And this is so astounding when you consider how different the octopus brain is from our own. This looks like some like weird kidney or a flower from Mars, but this is an octopus brain. Our brain has four lobes that you can see from the outside. They have, it depends on the species and who's counting, but between 50 and 75 lobes. And not only this, this central brain is not even where most of their neurons are. Most of their neurons are not in their brain but in their arms. So how can you be friends with somebody this different? This was one of the things that made me feel so honored to know Octavia and the other octopuses that, that I wrote about. And I'm going to share with you, to close, one of the most touching moments in my life that was totally unexpected, and it was towards the end of Octavia's life. Now, our life spans are very different, and our life cycles are very different from octopuses. We have our babies young, 
and we can have them for many years. We can have different clutches. Um, they just, most species just lay eggs at the end of their lives. And then the mother octopus in most species spends the remainder of her life, which may be months, doing nothing but guarding and cleaning those eggs. She will not leave her lair even to hunt. So one day when Octavia laid eggs, it was bittersweet for me. I was thrilled that she was able to do this natural thing. I was sad, though, because there was no Mr. Octopus, and her eggs were infertile. And I was also sad because I knew this was beginning of the end, and that now we would no longer look at each other through the water and play with each other, because she would be consumed with the job of protecting her eggs. But I loved watching her do this. And I continued to come in to see her from the public side. After six months in the wild, a giant Pacific octopus, her eggs would hatch and she would die. But Octavia's eggs were not fertile. Her eggs weren't hatching. Six months went by, seven, eight, nine months went by. The eggs began to disintegrate. And still she didn't die. And still she didn't abandon them. But after 10 months, when the eggs were disintegrating, her body too began to disintegrate. And I noticed she had a big eye infection. So I talked to the keeper, and he agreed that she should be taken off exhibit and allowed to live out her final days in a dark, quiet place the way a mother octopus in the wild would be able to end her life. And once he removed her from the exhibit, I realized I'd have one more chance to see her again, that I could look down at her through the water and she up at me like we used to. But I didn't know for sure she'd recognize me because giant Pacific octopuses only live three to five years. And I'd known her for two years, but the past 10 months, that's like decades to an octopus. I wondered if she'd know me. So when I went in and Bill took the lid off of her tank, I was so moved and surprised to see that this old, sick, dying friend of mine made the effort to come to the top to see me. And she stretched out her arms and she stretched her suckers toward me and looked into my face. And we stayed together for minutes, old friends, saying goodbye. And she died not long after that. But she stayed with me and will stay with me to the end of my days because what she has given me has been this great gift. She's given me a new understanding of what it means to think and to feel and to know. And she's the one who opened up all these miracles, including the one that we're celebrating today. I can't tell you what I meant to the octopuses that I knew, but I can tell you the gifts that they gave me keep coming. We are now in the golden age of octopus research. In 2015, when my book came out that spring, there was no octopus emoji for your phone. You were lucky if you could get an octopus mug or an octopus t-shirt. Now you can have everything octopus. There have been wonderful other films and other books out there celebrating octopus. And particularly exciting is the new research that's coming out that we share with you in our new book, Secrets of the Octopus. And in this, we discover that for so long, almost everything we thought we knew about octopuses was false. They are the very embodiment of one of my favorite sayings, which I'm going to share with you in closing. And this is attributed to Thales of Miletus, the pre-Socratic uh, pre Greek philosopher. And that saying goes, the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. 
And to me, what that means is our world is incandescent with life. It is forever surprising. And it is holy. And the proper reaction to this is reverence and delight. So Warren and I are so proud to stand before you today, before the octopus, wrapped with awe. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> If people are raising their hands, you need to know we can't see you um, <laughs> because there's a big light up Just there. One, so would you can, you, can you see people? And you can call think, on them for I think he has the mic over oh, here. Oh, okay. Great, 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 great. We know you're there, even though we can't see you. Oh, well, now I can see some. How about now? Yes. Hi, my name is Robin. Um, as someone who loves the science behind things, what are some either scientific journals or other sources uh, that we could track for all of this science that is being released? Besides Octonation, obviously. <laughs> Well, you're likely to see it on Octonation first, actually. Um, the scientists that are profiled in the book and in the series, it, you could track them. Dr. Alex Schnell is um, doing some incredible behavioral uh, research on them, uh, both in the lab and in the wild. Um, doc, Dr. Chrissy Hufford, mm -hmm. uh, she has done some amazing research, although she's not focusing on them so much anymore. Um, Tatiana Leite, the uh, Brazilian uh, researcher who you'll meet in the film and in the book. She's discovered more than five new species of octopus since I met her uh, and has discovered that many of the common octopus, everyone thought was the common octopus, it's not the common octopus at all, but something else. What else would you add to yeah, that? I think following the the people with the most passionate about it, the scientists, uh, they typically, they're getting more and more social media savvy and they're all coming out because they know that Octonation is a platform that they can publish their work. Um, but yeah, maybe we, we need to publish a, a long list of the scientists so that people can follow them. Yeah, that's, that's a really a good idea. idea. Thank you, boy. <laughs> talk to anybody here that's interested in octopus, but the amiss, oh, I can't even, I'm sorry, the, the, the thing that octopus have is so amazing because they're not even from our planet, I feel, and they have the most amazing You're right, yeah. So what, what, I, what I always say when people say, like, they're aliens, I say, they're super terrestrial, actually. They're, they're like, super from this planet from the standpoint of, like, they're, 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 like, ocean's OGs, almost. It's like they've been here forever. And so I could see where they would come across to many as alien. But what I've learned with all my scientist friends uh, is just they've, they, I mean, they were on this planet for hundreds of millions of years. We're, us humans are kind of like a blip on the radar as it relates to life octopuses have it all figured out. And so I've always taken, kind of like looked at them, looked how resilient they are, how adaptable, how intelligent, and just, you know, are, are showing those values through octonation and through how we talk about the octopus. So, yeah. Actually, all of us are alien in that life came to the Earth from outer space. We were pelted with all kinds of stuff when our planet was just a lump. And uh, so, the age of Aquarius was right, uh, where we are all stardust. Hello, hello. Well, I was, 
it's gone up. <laughs> I was wondering where are your favorite, what's your favorite uh, aquariums to go see the octopus and favorite places on earth where, we, where you like to go to view octopuses? Well, this aquarium is right up there. <laughs> this aquarium rocks. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we've had the best day here today. And Mystic Aquarium, where we were last week, was fabulous. And New England Aquarium, of course, will always have a special place in, in my heart. And um, Oregon has some fantastic uh, aquaria. And oh my gosh, anywhere, anywhere there's an octopus, I'm going to be <laughs> riveted to it. Um, as far as places to dive and see octopus, I'm still a relatively new diver. And I have only seen octopus in the wild in two places because I, I don't basically ever take vacations. I only scuba dive for work. And, um, oh, actually, I think I saw an octopus in Ecuador, too. But Cozumel in Mexico, that was my first diving experience. And then I went to Morea with a team of octopus experts to research a children's book in the Scientists in the Field series that I founded called The Octopus Scientist. I worked with Dr. David Shield, Dr. Jennifer Mather, Dr. Tatiana Leite, um, and a fabulous photographer and a wonderful aquarist from Vancouver Aquarium, which also is a fabulous aquarium. Yeah, the reason on Octonation why, like in the second line, I put the photographer's name is one, because it's respectful, but two, you'd be surprised at how accessible everybody is as, as it relates to this world, especially underwater photographers. They love, you know, and I tell them, I'm like, does anybody DM you after like I post? And because we have, you know, millions of views on our content. This past year, we had over half a billion views on our educational content. And you'd be surprised at how often, I mean, how like it's very rare that people reach out to them and are very curious about their work. And they're the ones that are the most lit up to talk about it. So half the time, you know, they're talking to me as I'm like writing my, my blog post. But I would say that, you know, go on Octonation. Um, if you have a favorite species, you know, uh, start having a conversation with that underwater photographer. Um, I know that Chelsea has answered a lot of uh, people's questions as it relates to, you know, women in science and what schools to go to. How do you even study? Uh, her, she probably hate that I say this, her direct messages are open for that. Uh, she's just like, who is this person reaching out to me? I'm like, eh. Um, it's not like we have like, you know, a million followers. But, um, but yeah, so it's like people are so accessible, you know, nowadays. And it, it wouldn't hurt if you're uh, a budding underwater photographer, if you're an artist, if you're interested in a specific species, I would follow um, those underwater photographers. Um, the cool thing also about having Octonation in this, this TV series coming out is we've seen like a boom in just the octopus economy from the standpoint of underwater photographers are getting their footage licensed. Artists are, you know, that crochet are selling more of you their know, crochet octopuses. There are like, it's just, it's been really great for us from the standpoint of the more you can kind of contribute um, and find your place in, you know, Octonation, the more you can potentially create a career out of what you love to do. And so it's been really fun to have that platform for scientists um, to hire them to write for our blog or to just create something that I feel like has always needed to happen. Um, and I think after this, I mean, this book and solve an octopus, but we're like at an upward trajectory. <laughs> so, you know, um, keep, stay tuned. For sure. Do you have a Hi. microphone? Uh, oh. Hi. Yes. Hi, my name's Carrie. Um, thank you for coming and uh, enjoyed this very much. Um, have you ever heard of octopuses uh, building things? But not just uh, like using a shell or carrying a uh, shell around, but actually like creating um, a structure or anything like that? They sometimes do do the octopus's garden that Ringo Starr sang about. Um, sometimes they they, sometimes they just throw their dirty dishes out, you know, like you do at the hotel when you've had room service and leave it in the hall. That's a good way to find an octopus. You don't look for the octopus, you look for the shells of the animals that they, they ate. But sometimes they appear to want to have tchotchkes. And they, they'll go out and like get some. And why? I mean, you don't know. Even people who've had home octopuses have noticed that sometimes they escape 
and take your stuff and put it in their, t in their tank, which, which is amazing to me. They also, um, they, use, they do use tools, and they have been known, and you'll see in the, in the uh, TV show, um, at one point, there's an octopus who is beset with an annoying shrimp. This is a mantis shrimp mm -hmm. who's got pointy deals he can hurt you with, particularly if you have no shell. Well, octopus has lost the ancestral shell, but that doesn't mean they forgot what shells are for, because this guy, being beset by this annoying predator, he looks around, <laughs> And he sees a shell lying on the, on the floor of the ocean, picks it up, uses it as a shield. <laughs> One more question. <laughs> uh, hi. Yay. Uh, Look at this great <laughs> outfit. Hi, my name is Jasmine. I actually have a question for our awesome founder. Um, I know you guys used to do the whole Patreon sticker thing, which, by the way, lit me up every month. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, I, oh, I gotta see the stickers, I gotta see the stickers. Are you guys planning on doing anything else like that? I know it ended recently, so I was just curious. Yeah, it ended recently. We were trying to figure out, because we had Chris, who's an incredible graphic designer, and we were thinking of all the education that we want to bring into classrooms and really making sure that we're spending time developing out lesson plans. I really love this concept of Octopus Superhero Academy. And the kids, uh, we, we've done, done a lot of STEM fests. Um, and kids just get lit up. You know, um, uh, There's like a one lesson plan that's Octovision. And we put like glasses on the kids that allow them to see behind themselves. And then we hold up like animals that would eat the octopus, and they have to read off what, what the creature is from behind them so that they can learn that an octopus has nearly 360 degree vision. And so with, with Chris, we're having a lot of fun uh, dreaming up and ideating those characters. And I think they're, um, if you go to Octonation Sticker Club, you can see all the characters that we created and we wrote little storylines for them. Um, and we are talking about doing it, but instead of doing two, maybe just doing one a month. Um, because it was kind of a lot for him. Um, um, but yeah, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And um, we are definitely thinking about, um, one, releasing them all as coloring sheets um, to, to the public so they can get to know them. And two, kind of like rethinking what our monthly octopus would be. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. For sure. Um, I was wondering what kind of species of octopus have been most interactive of your years of learning about them? So the, uh, the blue, the day, Pacific day. Mm -hmm. Probably the Pacific day octopus. Um, I had a wonderful encounter with the Pacific day octopus in Morea and this was a, a huge female, and she was missing several arms that had been bitten off by somebody. She was a bold octopus. That did not stop her. Having bitten, having those arms gone didn't stop her one bit. And she was hunting. She reached out to me and touched me. This wild octopus who just met me like a second before reached out and touched me. And then, as if to say, come on, allowed me and my friends to follow her as she hunted. So, and that happens frequently, and you will see footage on the, on the TV series of a Pacific Day octopus who is doing just that with Dr. Alex Schnell. Well, thank it. you so much. Oh, for thank sure. you. Great question. I, I didn't really want to cut off questions, but when we have a book signing, there tends to be a line, and I want everybody to have an opportunity to get their book signed. And, and so after this, we'll be able to, you'll be able to exit out the, the lower level. Um, there's cocktails, beer, drinks, artwork, and time for conversation with the authors and get your own book. Um, and I have to say that if, if Aquaria can inspire a few more sighs and warns, we've had earned, our, uh, earned our keep. Because that's, that's what we're really all about. And I'll tell you my one, I don't know if they, it wasn't in a more recent book, famous evolutionary biologist, when you compare the learning of octopuses to children, 
they match children up to the age of five and how fast they learn and unlearn images. Next, uh, the next first Wednesday is about baby animals. So enjoy conversation, art, beverage, and get your book signed.